You're listening to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 026. I'm going to do daily plasma exchanges, and then I got a decision. And the decision is whether I feel like a turkey or a wiener. <laughs> okay. Okay? Am I going to stop cold turkey? Am I going to stop cold turkey? Uh-huh. Okay. Or am I going to wean them? I'm going to now go every other day, every third day, every fourth day, every fifth day, whatever. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Blood Bank Guy Essentials, episode 26. This is Joe Chaffin. I'm your host. Uh, Today marks a first for the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. Today's guest, Dr. Jeff Winters from Mayo Clinic, is exactly the same guest as last week's guest. Dr. Winters was with us last week for a, uh, in episode 25, for a, a introduction to therapeutic apheresis. And there was so much to cover and so much to discuss that I really felt like it was, it was, important for you to hear all of that from last week. And then he and I closed our conversation with a a semi-brief, about 20 20 or 25 minute look or so at the use of therapeutic plasma exchange in a very, very important disease, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So the rest of this podcast today is simply a look at TTP. Uh, Dr. Winter's taking us through the basics and how plasma exchange figures into that process. It's a really interesting and I hope very helpful look for you. And so I give you the rest of my conversation with Dr. Jeff Winters, this time discussing thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. All right. Well, so we've, we've, uh, I think we've covered, man, a ton of, a ton of the nuts and bolts. I want to make sure that we, that we take a little time to, to talk about thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, Jeff, because that's, that's the big daddy, as you, as you have, are, have already mentioned. And that's the, that's the thing that there's a lot of focus on. So why don't you, why don't you just start us off with just a little thumbnail description of what TTP is? So TTP, you know, um, what is TTP? So we, 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 we talk about the pentad, right? We talk about the uh, pentad of thrombocytopenia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, neurologic dysfunction, fever, and renal dysfunction. That You have these patients that present with this pentad or uh-huh. some component of this pentad. And what is going on in these individuals is that either from a congenital deficiency or the development of an autoantibody, they have decreased activity in an enzyme called Adams TS13. And I'm not going to say the long name because I never get it right, okay? So Adams <laughs> TS13 either. is great. You know, it's short. It's, yeah. it's brief. We can all remember that, okay? Yeah. And what Adams TS13 does is that as our endothelial cells are excreting ultra-large von Willebrand's multimers, Adams TS13 is coming along and it's clipping it down into its smaller multimeric units. Now, it turns Mm -hmm. out those ultra-large multipers are very sticky to platelets. They bind really well to glycoprotein 1B, okay, Mm -hmm. 1B9. And if we don't cleave that because we have a deficiency in enzyme because we have an antibody that's binding to it and blocking it or causing increased turnover or we were born without it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We get these, think of them as long strings coming out of the endothelial cells. And under high shear stress situations, they can unfold and mm. start binding to the platelets. So the picture that always is in my mind is a, is, is, is a string of pearls, right? Mm-hmm. With, the, with the string being the, the von Willebrand's factor, the pearls being the platelets on it. And now these platelet von Willebrand factor chunkies break loose mm-hmm. and head downstream. And they get lodged in the microvasculature. If they get mm-hmm. lodged in the microvasculature of the brain, guess what? Mm. Neurologic symptoms, news, if they get yeah. lodged in the microvasculature of the kidneys, renal failure. Um, mm-hmm. As the red cells are trying to find their way past these chunks in the kidneys and in the small vessels, right, they're getting shredded like uh, cheese going through a cheese slicer. And that's mm-hmm. where we see the microangiopathy characterized by the schistocytes, fragmented uh-huh. cells, and um, the, um, um, the thrombocytopenia, right, is where right. we're activating it. Okay. So that's what we see. Um, And so what we need to do in the context of treatment is to do plasma exchange. What we're goal, our goal is, is to replace the Adams TS13 with the plasma mm-hmm. that we're using as a replacement fluid and to remove mm-hmm. the inhibitory antibodies if that's what's causing it. And we may also derive some benefit from removing ultra-large von Willebrand's multipers and potentially some of the uh, fragments of red cells and other stuff that may be mm-hmm. circulating. Okay? okay? So that's where plasma exchange comes in. 
And, and we knew from way back when that when they used to do whole blood exchanges, when they used to do plasma infusions, that it seemed to be effective. Um, but, you know, people can't tolerate too terribly much plasma infusion. And so mm -hmm. Gail Rock, back in 1991 in the Canadian Aphoresis Study Group, they did a trial. They, they compared plasma infusion, two units, versus plasma exchange, an entire plasma volume, and they saw superior patient survival with the plasma exchange. Now, mm -hmm. a criticism is, hey, an entire plasma volume versus two units, mm. that isn't equivalent, right? Yeah. So there was a subsequent <laughs> trial where they did give an entire plasma volume infused. Uh -huh. Interestingly, what they found was that about a third of patients couldn't tolerate that volume, right? Yeah, volume was, overload, mm. okay? Yep, for sure. But those that could tolerate it actually had equivalent survival. Mm -hmm. Plasma exchange. Why am I mentioning this? Because you might be at a hospital as a physician, right, where um, you don't have an apheresis service, uh, mm -hmm. and you have somebody with TTP. Mm -hmm. Give them as much plasma as they will tolerate while you're <laughs> waiting to get them from your institution to wherever they're going to have the plasma exchange. Right. Right. Uh, when I practiced in Kentucky, that used to happen all the time in some of the smaller rural hospitals in eastern Kentucky. In the mm -hmm. winter months when the helicopters couldn't fly in and pick them up and bring them back to the University of Kentucky, and we'd have to send them via ground, via an ambulance, four-hour trip, uh, mm. you know, I'd say, hey, put a Foley catheter in them, put an IV in them, thaw all the plasma that you have, give them some Lasix, and go. Yep, yep. Yep. Okay. So the, you, you mentioned something really important there, Jeff. You mentioned a lot of really important things, but I, I want to I hone in on, on one thing because from the practical perspective, I think that there is a misconception out there. Um, I don't think it's as, as prevalent as it used to be, and I, I would love your perspective on this, but I think there's a perception that, oh, I don't have all five parts of the so-called pentad, so uh, it, I can't make the diagnosis yet. I think things have changed in terms of our feelings now, right? Oh, you got it. So I think, to be honest with you, if it enters into your differential diagnosis, if TTP mm -hmm. enters into your differential diagnosis, that in and of itself should be, should be sufficient to initiate plasma exchange. You can always stop. Well, you can always stop. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I'm going to give, um, um, I, I need to, to recognize the person who came up with this term. It was Joe Kiss. Um, mm -hmm. as, as crot cannot rule out TTP, right? <laughs> so we end up treating a lot of crot, okay? Uh -huh. Or we can't uh -huh. rule it out. And so that might be somebody who presents with mental status change, uh, microangiopathy, but their platelet count may still be relatively reasonable. Or maybe... Mm. Their platelet count's low, they get microangiopathy, but they don't have a significant mental status change at this point in time. Right. So right. any sort of variation. I, I, to be honest with you, I've treated people that have had platelet counts within the normal range, had mm -hmm. mental status changes in microangiopathy, and their Adams TS-13 level activity has come back undetectable. And they've responded mm. quite nicely to plasma exchange. Wow. Wow. So if it enters in your differential, I think that's grounds to move. And I should stress, this is is a medical emergency. Sometimes people mm -hmm. want to say, oh, we'll wait till the morning. You know, I, right. I, I've seen people die of TTP within mm -hmm. an hour of, mm -hmm. of, of presenting with their symptoms. So you really need to move quickly. So Adam TS-13 is now a, a, a measurable lab test. Yep. And what do you, there, there are people, I think, that have made that statement as well. Oh, well, let's, let's check the Adam TS-13 and then make a decision. How would you respond uh, to that? You know, once again, I think in most <laughs> folks, uh, you draw the Adam TS-13 and it goes out to the reference lab and you get a result back and the patient's dead. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it's <laughs> like three or four days, maybe 24 right. hours. Uh, yeah. You know, once again, uh, I... It, it's great. Uh, the Adams TS-13 level supports the diagnosis. So so my mm -hmm. practice, and, and again, this is my practice, right? Mm -hmm. I First of all, you need to draw the Adams TS-13 level before you do the plasma exchange, okay, because that messes yep. it up, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we draw the Adams TS-13. I start the plasma exchange. I can get those Adams TS-13 results back here at Mayo in six hours, and then I look at it. And if the oh, Adams wow. TS-13 activity is normal then that's going to prompt me to ask the question, okay, is there something else? I will continue doing the plasma exchanges while we evaluate for something else because occasionally mm -hmm. you may see people where the Adam's TS-13 level is not particularly low, um, mm -hmm. yet they do respond to plasma exchange. Maybe they have complement-mediated mm -hmm. uh, thrombotic mm -hmm. microangiopathy, what we used to formerly call uh, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. The right, plasma exchange right. would still be important there because in that context we are replacing the aberrant uh, complement pathway regulatory mm -hmm. proteins. 
So th- that's uh, point. There's there's a lot we could go into there, oh, but in yeah. the interest of time, I think I we could we, we could. I don't think we can get there either. But but that's by the way, I just want to mention six hours for an Adam TS thirteen level is atypical in my experience. It's well, awesome that you have that. Very much. But again, Mayo, we got a big reference lab, right? So <laughs> yeah. stuff's coming in. So they're they're getting stuff from all over the world and they're running those assays every six hours. So got know, it. depending upon my timing, I can get it mm-hmm. on and get the results turned around. It's it's okay. it's unusual. I mean it's not the usual way things understand. Work. So let's so let's let's take a, a, a specific let's take an example clinical scenario. A patient comes into the emergency department and they have a a, a platelet count in the fifteen to twenty thousand range. They have schistocytes on their smear. Their LDH is sky high, um, and nothing really else. But you you appropriately make the call. This is someone that that needs a that needs a plasma exchange for at least uh, cannot rule out TTP. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so what are the how do you how do you write the order? What what yeah is the what are the things that you're looking for technically to to make this happen so we're gonna the 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 sort of what we end up doing uh is first of all you know is is the is the people feel pretty comfortable that you know ttp is in differential the answer usually is Mm -hmm. yes the the Mm -hmm. laboratory evidence that you said there sounds like it so i'm Mm going to ask the clinicians to say hey go ahead and order uh the adams ts13 levels right Mm -hmm. go ahead and order also we always ask them to order uh a complement uh regular regulatory pathway profile as well, okay, just in case it's that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then, uh, depending upon what's going on, uh, you know, I may say to them, hey, go ahead and start getting an infusion of FFP while I'm getting the the troops... Nice. S- set up. I mean, we make yeah. a commitment here to be at the bedside within an hour of being called, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll be working to get my nurses going, okay? My mm-hmm. nurses are going to come in, and what they're going to do is the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to get everything. They're going to get out there, and they're going to take a look at this patient, and they're going to try to assess their vascular access. So mm-hmm. uh, it turns out that the greatest risk for complications, severe, like kill you complications from an apheresis procedure it's actually not the procedure itself but the central line placement so i no, do wow. try to do all my patients peripherally the other thing i mm-hmm. find is that it takes you know a good two or three hours for the radiologist to clear the central line <laughs> placement <laughs> you know so sure. and sometimes the radiologist or the surgeon or somebody saying i ain't gonna touch that patient their playlist counts uh 5, 000, 10, 000. i don't want to put a line in them so I prefer to do things peripherally if I can. And we uh-huh. will give them the benefit of the doubt. So if my nurse looks at it and says, I think I can get in, then we're going to go ahead and start. Worst case scenario, we can't get the procedure done. I can at least get a partial procedure in. Then I'm back in the situation to get in a line placed, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to try to use peripheral access for as long as I can, realizing that in the setting of TTP, they're usually going to get some bruising. Maybe yep. that next procedure will need a line, okay? Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. going to start the procedure. I'm going to treat them with a one plasma volume exchange using fresh frozen plasma as my replacement fluid, okay? 100%. I'm not mm-hmm. going to use any saline in this context. Mm-hmm. I'm usually using straight uh, citrate as my anticoagulant uh, because I don't want to give them any heparin. We here at Mayo do a little a mix of citrate and heparin is our, our replacement. But in this context, because their platelet counts are so low, you know, I, I don't right. want to give them any heparin, okay? Makes sense. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're going to try to get that, that plasma exchange in, at least get it started within an hour, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so once I get that first one in, then what's going to end up happening is they're going to be scheduled for daily oh. plasma exchanges. And I'm going to follow their platelet count, and I'm going to follow their LDH, and I'm going to follow their neurologic symptoms. Mm-hmm. And essentially, my goal is that I want a platelet count, and this is what's in the ESFA guidelines. I want a platelet count of 150,000 or greater, okay, on two consecutive, uh, I want, uh, that's why I'm a tar- platelet target, right? I mm-hmm. want a, a, a normalizing LDH. It doesn't have to be completely normal, but I want to head in mm-hmm. that direction, right? So if it started at 5,000 and I'm now at 500, I'm feeling happy. And then I want resolution of any uh, non-fixed neurologic symptoms, okay? So now, if they get to that platelet count, I'm going to do daily plasma exchanges, okay, for two more days once they hit 150,000. Mm-hmm. And then I got a decision. And the decision is whether I feel like a turkey or a wiener. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay? Am I going to stop ready. cold Go turkey? Ahead. Am I going to stop cold turkey? Uh-huh. Okay. Or am I going to wean them? I'm going to now go every other day, every third day, every fourth day, every fifth day, whatever. Okay. Now, for everybody listening here, 
Okay, this is real important. There is no, I'm going to repeat, no, I'm going to repeat again, no, scientific evidence supporting the superiority of stopping cold turkey versus weaning somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's none. Uh, to be honest with you, when I was a fellow, everybody got stopped cold turkey. When mm -hmm. I came back in 2001, everybody was getting weaned. I was like, what changed in Mayo? Jim George, Mr. Dr. TTP, published a mm -hmm. paper in Blood that said how I treat TTP. And he said, I wean everybody. And everybody said, okay, we're going to wean. Mm -hmm. In 2010, he published a paper, How I Treat TTP in 2010. He said, oh, I stopped people cold turkey. So the pendulum <laughs> swung the other way, okay? Yeah. So yep, yep. I just want to tell people there's no scientific evidence. So what do I do? To be mm -hmm. honest with you, my unscientific bias is this. If I have a patient who's going to be a really compliant patient, they're going to get their daily uh, CBCs. They're going to follow up with their hematologist. Mm -hmm. Stop and cold turkey. If they're going to be a non-compliant patient where they're not going to have family support, where they're uh, living out in the boonies, uh, mm -hmm. then maybe we'll go ahead and wean them more to make certain that we're following them uh, closely. But I, okay. I prefer to stop because, again, I don't want them to get trolley. I don't want them to get a transfusion-transmitted infectious disease mm -hmm. from the plasma mm -hmm. replacement fluid. Got it. Okay, so there are there are three last questions that I want to leave you with, Jeff, yeah. that I want to leave this talk with. So the first question is just from the practical perspective. Now, I'll, I'll just give you a little background on this. Um, I, I worked, I've worked in hospitals most of my career. For the last few years, I've been in blood center land, and I have seen many scenarios. Obviously, as you can imagine, and I know you know this, when you're exchanging someone with plasma, uh, it requires a significant amount of plasma. Yeah. And so we in blood center land see that. <laughs> and we see people obviously asking for plasma and it's because someone has TTP and they're exchanging them. Okay. But I have seen that go on for months sometimes, in which case I say, wow, are you really sure this was TTP? So I guess all that to ask you, how long should we expect this to take if it really is TTP? Is there some upper limit or is it, is it just as the cases go? I think you really need to treat the patient as the cases go. Now, by and large, mm -hmm. uh, people are going to respond. If you look in the literature, there are published reports that say most people are going to respond in somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, three to uh, ten exchanges. There mm -hmm. is literature out of, again, the Canadian Apheresis Study Group um, that talked about if somebody hasn't responded within 10 to 12 exchanges using fresh frozen plasma as a replacement fluid, and I would substitute thawed plasma in that setting as well, that you can mm -hmm. switch them to cryopore plasma. Thought being that that doesn't have von Willebrand's factor in it, okay? Which is involved okay. in physiology. And that a significant proportion of those patients may, um, may respond. So my practice, and, and again, this is not randomized controlled trial driven, okay? My practice mm -hmm. is this. I'm going to go 10 to 12 procedures, FFP. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, they're not responding. Okay, next step, I'm going to switch them to cryopore plasma. I'm going to mm -hmm. do cryopore plasma for, me, let's say, another four or five procedures. Oh, they're still not responding. I'm going to bounce my volume exchange from one to one and a half plasma volumes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do that for a few more procedures. Usually in, in the same period of time, my uh, hematology colleagues are also giving them, uh, giving them steroids, uh, mm -hmm. and they may be talking about giving them rituximab uh, as well, uh, mm -hmm. and they may start doing that. Uh, if they're still not responding after bouncing the volume up, uh, then we start talking about things like, uh, let's do twice a day plasma <laughs> exchange. Oh, wow. Um, I'll be honest with you, there have been very few times when I've had to do that because usually escalating it, as I just described, is taken care of. Mm -hmm. And right. we get them off. Now, are there patients that keep on going and going and going? Yes. And I think if, you're, if you escalate your therapy and you're not seeing a response, uh, you need to start asking yourself, especially if the Adams TS-13 was not measured or did not come back... Um, um, indicating there was a deficiency, you need to start saying, hey, is this the right mm -hmm. diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there something else going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, you're sort of stuck. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's I think that's true. That's been my experience as well. But I I will admit that I in those scenarios I always tell residents once we start the plasma exchanges it doesn't mean you turn off your brain. Correct. You still need to be thinking about oh, is yeah. this re, is this diagnosis proper and correct. And so. here, let me tell you, I'll, I'll give you just one brief 
uh, story, very brief. Mm-hmm. Had somebody when I was a fellow, right? We were treating mm-hmm. TTP, and this was back when we were actually used to use a partial heparin uh, citrate anticoagulant on these mm-hmm. on some of these patients, right? And uh, boy, everything got better except for their platelet count. <laughs> <laughs> and the hemonc fellow that was uh, who I was working with, because I was a fellow, looked uh-huh. at me one day and said, "Could this be hit?" <laughs> And you know what? Uh oh. It was yeah. hit. <laughs> yeah. And the minute that we actually stopped doing the plasma exchanges, the platelet count came up. Because this guy yes. this patient, um didn't I mean he didn't have any evidence really of anything other than the thrombocytopenia at that point in mm-hmm. time. Everything mm-hmm. else had resolved. Yep. So it happened. And that's the the turn off your brain statement. So that's that was question one, the how long question. Question two, you already mentioned this, and you you, uh, you mentioned cryo, cryopore or cryoreduced plasma. And I, I just want to real quickly, because I think there's a decent amount of confusion among resident types in particular and among people in blood banks who may have never seen that before. What, what actually is cryoreduced plasma? It's leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Junk. when it's it's when the blood center uh, is making cryoprecipitate, mm-hmm. uh, basically the cryopore plasma is the leftovers. Uh, right. So you really can't utilize it um, to, for example, replace coagulation factors because mm-hmm. uh, fibrinogen and, and factor eight are, are gone out of it. Mm-hmm. Right, that's in the cryoprecipitate. But what is left behind is the Adams TS thirteen. So mm-hmm. it works really well for TTP. Now, people used to say, well, what now? It's got no von Willebrand's factor in, so maybe it's going to be better. There have been Mm -hmm. a couple of randomized controlled trials that have actually looked at uh, newly diagnosed TTP patients, randomizing them to FFP versus cryopore plasma. And, and in, in new diagnosed, newly diagnosed TTP patients, it, it doesn't make a difference. So okay. it, it is a waste product. You can, mm-hmm. if your blood center is agreeable, uh, sometimes get it at a discount <laughs> relative to FFP, mm-hmm. right? Because uh, <laughs> otherwise there's not much they can do with it other than maybe yeah. sell it real cheap to a plasma fractionator. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you might, Use that as your standard replacement, and that's fine. The key mm-hmm. there is if you are using it as your standard replacement, remember, not all the coag factors are present. So you might need to right. tune them up with a little FFP at the end uh, to Good replace thought. coag Good factors. Point. Okay? But, okay. but that's, that, that works. That's the, it, it can work as a primary replacement fluid. Okay. And so that's number two. First was how long to go. Second was the cryo-reduced, what, what is all that about? And the last one, I think, is, is a really practical one, specifically for, uh, well, primarily for pathology residents and other trainees, but uh, for other people as well. If you look at any list, I think anywhere in any standard textbook that talks about contraindications to platelet transfusion, they will include TTP in that list. But if you actually go into hospitals and look at patients who have been diagnosed with TTP, my guess is, Jeff, the majority of them have gotten transfused yeah. with platelets, and they seem to be alive. Help me, Jeff. What's the deal? You know, there are some reports, and they're, 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 they were basically case reports where there was mm-hmm. a patient. They had TTP. Somebody decided to give them a platelet transfusion because they didn't know they had TTP or mm-hmm. they were unwilling to put in the central line without giving them a platelet transfusion. <laughs> right. And lo and behold, suddenly they had deterioration of their ner- nervous system or they had deterioration mm-hmm. of the renal function, or something bad happened, right? And right. they said, oh, must be the platelets, because we know, again, if we think about the pathophysiology and those platelets binding to the ultra-large von Willebrand's multivers, are we dumping some fuel on the fire? Mm-hmm. All that stuff, again, is sort of anecdotal case reports. Yep. I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who <laughs> saw somebody who once heard about something. Right. Um, and not necessarily um, evidence-based. Now, you know, yep. you and I were talking before we got started on this that you used to be out at Cedar sinai and I think mm-hmm. uh, somebody that you may have worked with, Dennis Goldfinger, actually mm-hmm. had one of the fellows out at Cedar sinai take a, a look at what their experience was. Now, let's look and see. Did, were patients out there that mm-hmm. uh, had received platelet transfusions uh, and had TTP? Did, did they, did, they, did they deteriorate? Did they have a greater risk of death? And if I'm remembering small numbers, so that makes it a little hard to interpret, didn't see anything. I know yeah. uh, Dennis, you, Dennis felt pretty strong about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, again, <laughs> here's the key, I think. Here's the take-home point. It's a relative contraindication because, you know what, folks? People with TTP, they don't bleed. <laughs> mm-hmm. So exactly. even though their platelet count might be 5,000, 
they're not going to bleed. They're actually right. clotting, right? They're having microvasculature, throm microvascular thrombosis, right? Right. Such an important point, um, yes. So the issue may not be so much that they're going to get worse. It's just that they don't really need it, right? Right. They right. don't really need it. And it drives me okay. a little batty when I get somebody who says, oh, yeah, that's 5,000. I'm not going to put a central line in them in unless you give me mm -hmm. some platelets and get them over mm -hmm. 50,000. And I'm like, guess what? And get above 50,000. <laughs> That's not happening. It ain't happening. No, no matter how much playlists I give them, it's not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Well, that uh, I I appreciate that because that's. Uh, however, though, Jeff, if you were if you were counseling one of your residents who said, Doctor Winters, if they ask me this on the boards, what should I say? What would you What would your response uh, be? I would say it's a relative contraindication. Yeah, I would say yeah. that's how you answer. You know, there's there's practicality, and then there's sometimes board exams. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it's out there in the literature. I think we need to um, respect those case yeah. reports. Um, Agreed. Um, but but realize it's 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 the quality of the evidence is mm -hmm. not so great. I not got so it. Great. Well, Jeff, we have. Uh, I, th I think we are out of time. Um, this has been really just a, a fantastic review. So I have to ask you, and I'm going to put you on the spot here while you're on the recording. Would you be willing to come back another time and talk some more stuff? Sure, we can talk some other stuff. We can talk a little bit about, you know, uh, some real bizarre things like photophoresis maybe and nice. things that residents might not be exposed to in their program yet. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. American Board of Pathology may be asking you questions indeed. about. Mm -hmm. yes, so photo, indeed. LDLA, phoresis, cytoreductions. reductions, I think those are important things that we can chat about. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so very much for, for being a guest on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. I, I can't wait to, to get together again, but for now, thank you again very much. It was fun. I um, you know want to thank you for actually making this resource available to people. Um, for, for the folks listening, I just want to make a comment. It's gonna, mm -hmm. I'm going to make you feel old because we had talked about this before. <laughs> But, you know, uh -oh. yeah, he, he, he used to do uh, a, a board review course, right? Speak at a certain company, offers a board review course. And I can mm -hmm. remember sitting in the audience and listening to you do the blood bank review <laughs> uh, a couple of years before I sat for my board. So, uh, oh, wow. yeah. And you did I hope a, I didn't put you to sleep. No, you did a wonderful <laughs> job. Learned a lot. Uh, uh, you know, really um, uh, solidified some stuff. And, uh, you know, my residents and fellows here at Mayo greatly appreciate the effort that you put forward. Um, and uh, really are appreciative of the resources. I mean, you, you've, you've made a great impact to residents uh, and people wanting to learn about blood banking. So thank you for doing that and putting the effort huh. forward. You're very kind, Jeff. I appreciate it. Well, thank you once again, and we'll catch you next time. Sounds good. Have a good one. Hi, it's Joe with just a couple of closing thoughts. I want to thank you very much for listening to last week's podcast and this one, the two-part series on therapeutic apheresis and TTP. I also want to thank my guest, Dr. Jeff Winters, very much uh, for his time. Over the course of 2017, I really would like to interact with you in, in some new and different ways. Um, in case you're not aware, uh, I primarily interact on social media through Facebook and Twitter. If you, For Facebook, if you go to facebook.com slash bloodbankguy, what you'll find there is a, a whole lot of interactions that I do with, with people on a, on a relatively real-time basis, including something I started doing recently called the Blood Bank Guy 5 and 10, where I take five of your questions and answer them in 10 minutes or so on Facebook Live. It's, it's, you can find the old videos there uh, at, at, at facebook.com slash bloodbankguy. And uh, I plan on continuing that and doing new stuff as we go along. You can also find me on Twitter. Uh, they, my handle is at blood bank guy. That's pretty simple. And of course, you can always find me on my main website, which is bbguy.org. I wanted to let you know there is something new that I'm working on for 2017. It's a new blood bank review option, not just for pathology residents, but really for anyone who's interested in reviewing blood banking. It's coming out sometime in 2017. Uh, I would love to keep you posted on that. So if you wouldn't mind, go to bbguy.org slash subscribe. Um, and you can sign up for the for the notification list. And please don't worry, I will never spam you. I won't give your email to anybody else. I just want to keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Also, I realize that many of you listen to this while you're on the go, but the next time you're in front of your computer, if you don't mind, please go to iTunes, give this podcast a subscribe and a, a rating, please. That just, again, helps us get an 
get the podcast in front of as many people as possible. So thank you once again for hanging out with me. I'm, I'm really grateful that you do so. Uh, we are up over 30,000 downloads of the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast, and that's a great thanks to you. I really, really appreciate it. So as always, as I leave you, I hope that as you go through your day, that you'll smile and that you'll have fun. And above all, you'll never, ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time on the podcast.